So friends, as usual, we will start with the lamp lighting, but we have in our midst Ayon Maharaj today who has kindly consented to bless us with some shlokas at the beginning and then we will have a lap life. I don't know if you can come up here. The same way, adjust this for that. for making this congenial atmosphere for us to do with the other. Thank you. 
friends, welcome to another conference here, but a, I would say a special one this time because we've got uh, participants from different parts of the world. And uh, I was just thinking in my opening remarks to start with the cue, as it happens in theater, someone gives you the cue to say something, and he says, Tatya Charcha. So straight away, if we accept the dictum, sa vidya ya vimunchate, then does virtue ethics address this concern? Because one of the things we should do is to problematize the idea of virtue ethics and not simply adapt it in our usual catch-up method. You know, uh, we all know how this return or turn towards virtue ethics started in our times. It was because of G.E.M. Anscombe. And G.E.M. stands for Gertrude Elizabeth Margaret Anscombe, who was born in, um, in Ireland and uh, came to England. She converted from Protestantism to Catholicism and picketed abortion clinics as well. But she wrote this wonderful essay in 1958, which I read last night. And that essay on moral philosophy is credited to have started this virtue ethics turn in contemporary philosophy. And uh, that essay also invented the, the, the term consequentialism. Yesterday, Thanks to you know our modern technology, I was counting the number of times the word consequence occurs in that paper of us. Several times, but then there's only one time where she actually uses the word consequentialism. She says, um, if I can find it, because I never find things when I want them. Let me see if I can succeed in finding this. Uh, yes, here it is. This move on the part of Sidwick, she's talking about, she's engaging with another philosopher called Sidwick. This move on the part of Sidwick explains the difference between old fashioned utilitarianism and that consequentialism as I name it, which marks him in every English academic moral philosopher since then. And one must ask, like, why did Anscombe write this paper? And uh, Hetu, as we call it, but Hetu was right there in the first, second sentence. She says, it is not profitable for us at present to do moral philosophy. And some corrective, and there's a reason for it. And a corrective was required. And that's why she wrote this paper. And the reason why it was not profitable, according to her, is because from the time of Aristotle, where virtue ethics was done as a natural uh, part of doing philosophy, there was the Christian interregnum, where what she calls uh, the dominance of uh, the law conception of ethics takes over. The law conception of ethics. And this, with the emphasis on sin and redemption and the divine law and human beings trying to reconcile with the divine law and so forth, lose that virtue orientation, character building, etc., which was a part of the so-called pagan world, which we also shared, that ethos we shared with the Greeks. So for us, it is very natural to do virtue ethics in a manner of speaking. But my real point here was that what are we bringing to the table? Are we playing catch up and saying, you know, virtue ethics is a big deal in the West and we haven't done much of it, so let's, you know, give our own uh, <coughs> adaptation. We are very good at import substitution. So, we do something, we do it But years later, or are we going to uh, give a new twist, a new definition, make a significant contribution to this discourse on virtue ethics? Or are we going to refute it? That's the move I was making, where if virtue or the 
cultivation of virtues is not tied to some form of transformative soteriology, where, which it is in Indian traditions, I believe. If you look at the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, the Yama and the Niyamas are, you know, at, at one level, they are deontologies because they're a set of rules to follow, but they are supposed to lead to samadhi in the end. And it may not be in that order because Ashtang Yoga means it's an integrated or integral philosophy. Rani, we will talk about Shorabandhu, but so how do we separate deontology, consequentialism, you know, and virtue ethics, first of all, and secondly, what's the point of cultivating virtues? It's not just because of the good life or human flourishing, or what is it called in, 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 uh, in Greek? I don't... Eudaimoni, Eudaimonix is... In our... Mangala. Mangal. Yeah, which can be translated in English. Uh, exactly. And that's <laughs> why we have all our, uh, you know, in fact, you might say that Dram Karni Ki Shurnayama Deva is, is a Mangalacha at the, at the beginning. So, but the real question is if you can't get uh, the state of Chitta Pragya, let's say, or Jivan Mukti, then what is the point of cultivating virtue <coughs> is also a question. It's not just for public good or private benefit. You know, today is Karwa Chauth, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking that if my wife was not doing Karwa Chauth, <laughs> thankfully, were to ask me what is virtue ethics, I would simply explain it in this way, that if you did Karwa Chauth because you are supposed to do it, and it's a set of rules you're supposed to follow, that would be deontology. If you did it for the benefit of your husband, let's say, which is how it's supposed to be, it would be consequentialism of a sort. <clears throat> but if you did it for your own welfare, to cultivate the virtue for its own sake, it would be virtue ethics. If you were a feminist, you would protest by not doing it, saying, why is it imposed upon me? So it would actually become an anti-virtue, you know? And it would lead to a different kind of consequentialism where you want to destroy a tradition which is seen as oppressive, you know. But I'm putting out these ideas because, though I'm not a philosopher, I must say, right in the... I, I put it this way, I'm not a student of philosophy at all, but I'm a lover of wisdom. Well, our idea is everybody must be a philosopher, <laughs> or we are lacking something very important. Precisely. So, my fundamental question is that whether it's moral philosophy or virtue ethics, if it is not tied to the attainment of wisdom, I think there's something lacking in it. And if moral philosophy is bankrupt today, or was in the 50s after the war and because of the demise of that traditional form of Christianity, at least for us in India, if it is not tied to this larger quest for jivan mukti or sadhana, self-realization, I think there's something lacking in moral philosophy. That's the, uh, I just thought that I put it out right at the beginning. So I've jumbled up, uh, you know, how I was supposed to do my opening remarks. I was supposed to actually welcome you. Oh, well, please go ahead. <laughs> and so I want to welcome you now formally. <laughs> no, no, I mean, you continue on the class. <laughs> Uh, so welcome once again, all of you, especially people who have come from far off and people who are very near to us and dear to us, our own fellows. And the second thing Dada asked me to do, in fact, that was the second thing, but I'll, I'll do it as the third thing. He says, please say something about the Institute and the work you do here. But I'll make it the, the third thing. The second thing I want to do is to tell you how this conference came about. So we were at the World's Parliament of Religion at Toronto last year. Was it November or September? November. November. And uh, I met Sitan Shuddha there. And he said, you know, Makran, you know, I believe that you have become the director of the Indian No, no, I didn't know that. He actually didn't know that. Okay. So I'm jumbling it up. As usual, see, memory plays tricks. Okay. So let me, let me start again. Let me try again. So he said, you know, Makran, isn't it very important to do a conference on virtue ethics? I said, done, let's do it. And then maybe I told him, look, 
you know, I happen to be the director of Indian Institute of Advanced yeah. Studies, yeah. and let's do it there. But after that, the reason this conference has come about is because of the one year's labor that he put in. From November last, when we said that we thought it shubha some kalp se amni shuruwa ki thi, to jab hamne kaha, to no ne meditate ki isko karne, ye karne laayi cheeze, aur ye hum kar sakte hain, aur karna chahiye. To uske paschat, Sitan Shudha ne bhaat mahanat ki, aur aaj, he's the magnet, okay? And आज जो लोग यहाँ देख रहे हैं देश विदेश से तो इनका यहाँ मौजूद होना और उसकी वजह है उसका श्रेय सिद्धांत शुद्धा को जाना चाहिए। So let's give him a big hand and I also want to welcome his supputra आनंद जी who works in the business and corporate world but he's a very deep and sincere thinker, philosopher and practitioner of virtues himself. So both of them have worked relentlessly to make this happen. So this is how, and it was, you know, it was, it's almost like magic. We thought we should do it and ho bhi raha hai. But as I said, that's, we have done very little, but the, oh, the, 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 the shrey should go to the mm -hmm. So I've said the, I've done the second thing in my bucket list after welcoming you. The third thing is, of course, to say something about the Institute. <coughs> he said I should say, something about the institute and I, I, the thing I want to say is we, you know, this is an institute which was founded by a philosopher who also was the president of India, Dr. Sarve Pali Radhakrishna. And in some ways he <coughs> embodies the ideal of the philosopher king of Plato. Why do I say that? Because he gave a part of the presidential estate to start this institute. This is something, uh, it's, it's an act of great generosity, but it also shows a, a great vision on his part, that there should be a place in India where we pursue <coughs> deep ideas and contemplate on them, discuss them, problems confronting humanity, not superficial things, not trend-driven things. He believed there should be a place in India where this can be done. It should be away from the hustle and bustle of cities. And, and as, you, as you know, in, in Germany, which has such a great tradition of philosophy, there's always a philosopher in Beck, and there's always a bug the town. You know, I spent some time in Tübingen, and it's there in Heidelberg, and all these places. So you walk up there, and you see the town from below. And from up there, you see the town below. Everybody looks like a little ant. And, cars moving, you know, they appear almost miniature. <clears throat> but it gives you a sense that there are things, uh, you know, more than the mundane activities with which all our energies are consumed and worth thinking about, dreaming about. And I think uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan wanted such a place. And the uh, Vice Regal Lodge, from where the British ruled India and plundered India, I mean, what better location than this to contemplate the deeper truths because the, you know, the Sanatan Parampara survived this tremendous trauma, I would say, of colonialism and centuries of foreign rule. And it's time to regroup. It's time to think about who we are in a, in a deep and sure. fundamental sense. And I think Dr. Radhakrishnan was very well aware of it. And the entire the state of the Vice Regal Lodge was given for this purpose, including the many homes here. And if you, if you see that you know our buildings are run down, our walls are shabby. Uh, uh, you know this is this is the fallout of what happens to a post-colonial society whose priorities are slightly different. But nevertheless, I just hope that the that our ideas and what we discuss over the next couple of days to make these shabby walls and grimy walls shine again. Uh, and I think that for the last few days, we've actually been in that zone. Uh, we've had a wonderful conference on, uh, on Gandhi's economic ideas, where in, in a fundamental sense, virtue ethics came to the fore. In the Ikadasha Vrat of Gandhi, there was a great paper by one of my colleagues from JMU, which was about Arthashastra, but this is how she stepped out. But 
He said, what was the aim of Arthashastra? It was to create a decent society and uh, enshrine uh, uh, dharma above politics so that the king became the custodian and the practitioner of Raj Dharma, not a despot. And then he said, what is a decent society? So he said, the decent society is one where the human potential can flower. So that is a, 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 a dynamic, what's it? You don't, you don't, you dynamic. So that is a decent society is one where there's you dynamic well-being, I would think. And then he said something to me which was even more profound. He said, a decent society allows human flowering in such a way that an ideal such as the sthita pragya becomes worth pursuing. That is a decent society. Because in today's decent society, what is an ideal worth pursuing? It is to bet, get a you know, good house, fast car, you know, to have bhog, sanskriti, you know, uh, consumerism, which in the end consumes you and creates more and more anxiety. As we know, Gandhiji said that, uh, that even the promised fulfillment of all your wishes and wants that promised fulfillment is belied, and that is the dark tunnel, you know, in Vrindarana Upanishad. You, when you pass away, you can go the smoky way. That's the dark tunnel that stares us at the end of our endeavors in, in the pursuit of the good life, where there is no samadhan, no fulfillment, uh, despite the multiplication of the goods. We are smothered by goods go to an average U.S. home, and that malaise is now in India. It's full of stuff. You know, you open any closet, it's full of stuff. And I had a defining moment when I, I, I went to the home of a friend, and you know uh, what happens to Indians when they go abroad? Because there's centuries of a sense of lack and want. So they, they, they do shopping therapy. So on weekends they look at, you know, what's available and uh, they have wonderful bargains, they're great bargain hunters, you know how Indians are. And then I realized what they're doing is they're taking the junk from a shop and transferring it to their home. And they think they've made a good bargain. And uh, I visited this home over a period of 10, 15 years and I found the junk increasing. In fact, there was a whole room full of such stuff. And when we started out, I asked uh, this person, a good friend of mine, uh, you know, who was a very successful lady, uh, you know, career-wise, I said, why do you go and shop? She said, there's always somebody in India who needs this stuff. And, and I really believed it. I, I, I really thought that was a good motive to shop. But after 10, 15 years, the stuff wasn't reducing. So either it was not going into the hands of the people it was supposed to go into the hands of, maybe the transportation costs were enormous, or the trips to India were getting less and less frequent, or maybe the people in India didn't want that junk anymore. But the piles of junk, and I tell you, come to Delhi, come to these homes in South Delhi or Central Delhi, open any cupboard, it's full of junk. See the number of shoes there are, see the number of clothes and so forth. So Gandhiji, figure this out fundamentally. So all I was saying is that this paper said that a society where the ideal of a sthita pragya is valued as a decent society. It's not a society where you know, the, the ideal of uh, achieving a very high level of material prosperity, which should give you liberty from other wants, that alone does not make a decent society. And then he went a step ahead and said that what is a sthita pragya? So he said, a sthita pragna is, is, is a person who is conscious of consciousness. I thought that was a very well put uh, summing up. And so what I'm trying to say is we've got a wonderful segue from Gandhi and his pursuit of, of virtue and virtue ethics to this conference. And if we keep having meetings like this here, gathering of intellectuals such as yourselves, I think these grimy walls will shine. 
So I think this is what the institute was meant to do. And Dr. Radhakrishnan, who is the Spalding Professor of Philosophy in Oxford, understood this. He was earlier philosopher, I mean, he was earlier professor of philosophy in Kolkata for a long time, and wrote some of his famous books from that. He was a practicing philosopher himself, and then became president of India. And I was looking him up yesterday, and his first book was on ethics. This is the point I was trying to make in my long-winded fashion. And you can be a little more long-winded because Anita Ri's paper has not come. So I'm deliberately, you know, yeah, please. piecing it out in that fashion, not out of disrespect for time. But I want to tell you uh, the title of his book, his first book. Uh, somebody may remember it, but I was looking it up yesterday. The Ethics of the Vedanta and its Metaphysical Presuppositions. It was published from Madras by the Guardian Press in 1900. His first book was on ethics. And in this institute, we've had several directors who have been professors of philosophy. In my own time, I remember uh, Professor Margaret Chatterjee, who was a director here. Some of us knew her. She passed away recently. We had uh, a commemoration for her. And uh, uh, some people in this room spoke about her, gave a tribute to her. Then, Professor Brinal Miri was a director twice here, uh, who was also a professor of philosophy. So we've had several directors who have been professors of philosophy, and that is reflected. I just <coughs> took, a, took out some random books that we published in, uh, in the IIAS. So here's a book called uh, Mapping the Bodhi Charya Avatara Essays on Mahayan Ethics. <coughs> by uh, Pabitra Kumar Roy. So this is on the great treatise of Shantideva. I've dabbled a little bit in Nalanda Buddhism. And so this book is on that. It's a commentary on that treatise of Shantideva, but it's on ethics. And here's another book that we did. It's called Ethics in Indian Materialist Philosophy in its Social Perspective. Vijayananda Kaal, and it's a good book. I was reading it last night. Mm -hmm. Ji was <laughs> kind enough to send me a PDF version. And it, it covers, uh, you know, uh, all these uh, Ajita Kesha, Kambali, you know, all these, so, so to speak, uh, you know, materialist, Charvaks, uh, Sanjaya, Meerutta, Putta, Pakkhuda, Kachayana, Purna, Kashyapa, Makkhali, Gosha, and uh, and all of this. So, and of course, uh, uh, A.L. Basham's thesis was on these philosophers. His PhD thesis was on. So he was the one who brought them out again. So we've done this book here in IIS. Here's a book by Kali Charan Rauta on ethics, man, morality, spirituality, religion, and liberation, which we've also published from IIS. Here's a book by one of my colleagues from Diu, Shishindu Chakraparty. Towards an ethics and aesthetics of the future, written in Tagore, 1930, 1941. We have a paper on Tagore here, and uh, this two copies came here. Here's another book. Uh, they brought other. Uh, yeah, this is ethics and spirituality, and then Agarwal. So, uh, this is an area that interests us. It interests our founder, Dr. Radha Krishnan. We want to continue to pursue conferences, talks, and publications, <coughs> publications in this field of philosophy on ethics. And I hope, Sitanshuda, that a book comes out of this conference, so that we put it out there already. And I hope all of you send in your papers, and we gather a few more. And I hope that this becomes a foundational text, a foundational essay or venture into the field of virtue ethics from an Indian standpoint. I hope this is what this resulting publication becomes. So, uh, so this is what we do in the Institute. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to announce that this ongoing concern or ongoing commitment to ethics is reflected in our Radha Krishnan Memorial Lecture, which is coming up on the 21st of November. 
Delhi at the India International Center at 10.30. And it is to be delivered by His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. And the topic is universal ethics. And our former president, Sri Pranam Mukherjee, Bharat Ratna Sri Pranam Mukherjee, has very kindly consented to preside over this. So all of you are welcome. So our pursuit of contemplation, thinking, and publishing in the field of ethics, I hope will continue uh, in, the, in, in the days and years, in fact, to come. I want to say just a couple more things, take them off my bucket list, um, and then we can, uh, uh, I'll just hand it over to, uh, to Sitam Shuda. And then, of course, we'll have a tea break at about 11. And uh, um, in fact, we have an extra few minutes even yeah, beyond please. that. So we can, uh, you can uh, okay. well, let's say a couple of points. But I'm just saying that you know, in the flow, we'll have a tea break. But before the tea break, we won't have a picture with everybody. That's all I was trying to say. Um, but again, when I was uh, thinking about virtue ethics in the Indian context, you know, we have so many lists of virtues. You know. Many of our texts, you know, in fact, uh, uh, I, I want to also, at this moment, show you a little slide, because in the end, I want to take uh, a slide with you. You know, right from the ancient times to the modern times, this, the thing that I want to show you is the, is the wheel of virtue of process uh, process. This was from the Shirobinda Ashram. This is Neera Alpasa, who in the mother, and these are the 12 virtues which stand for each petal in the symbol of the mother. And you know, doesn't this remind us of the list of virtues in, in the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle? He's got a list of virtues too, isn't it? And uh, I mean, what better place to start listing virtues than you know, in the Ramayana, where the very first verse is Tapasvadhyaya, Niratam, Tapasvi, Vagvadi, Vagvidam, Param. My Sanskrit is non existent, but I'm, it's okay. We can make a mistake. We can make a mistake. <laughs> as, as they say, as they say, Pramado uh, Abhi Dhimantam. So, you know, and I'm not even a Dhimantam, so I can make. So, Naradam, you know, Paripa, Pracha, Valmikihi, Munihi, Pungava. So, Valmik, I mean, Valmiki himself is a Muni Pungava. That's a virtue. And then, Tapa Svadhyay, Nirantar Jo Tapa Svadhyay Karte Hai, Vaisi Narajji Ne Saval Pucha. So, it starts with an enumeration of virtues. But then, look, look at the next, when they say, when he says, Kahanu Asmin Sampratam Loke Gunavan Ka Chaviryavan Dharmatya Chakrutatya Chasatya Vakyo Dhravrata. Where, you know, is a person in this world who is principled, who is conscientious, who is a redeemer, a truth teller, who is self motivated? It's I'm just making it up, but I mean, so isn't it an enumeration of virtues? And that's how the Ramayana starts. And of course, in the second chapter of the Gita, there's an enumeration of virtues. Then there is an enumeration when we talk about the Daivi Sampad. So our texts are full of these enumerations, and they're not only in the Dharma Shastras, where you might see them in a, in a deontological manner descriptions of rules of conduct. But these virtues are in a, in a virtue ethic sense, enumerated so that we cultivate them in our, in our daily life. Isn't it? And, uh, and so I was thinking, and yesterday, I mean, when we were speaking in Toronto, Dada said in his usual fashion, you know, there's hardly any work done in India on this, on virtue ethics, which is, a, of course, a fact. But with my curiosity, I started looking around, you know, to see like what was available, and then I found, uh, I found, uh, I think some of you know, you know, 
some some of these some of these philosophers. I found this um, 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 you know, article by Professor Pina Gupta. You probably know her. She was at the University of Columbia at Missouri. I met her a couple of times in the U.S. and Journal of Religious Ethics. She's published a thing called Bhagavad Gita: Duty and Virtue Ethics. Some reflections. And I read this paper yesterday. I was also happy to find another paper by a very young scholar, which I want to mention, uh, who maybe we can invite, uh, uh, Diposhika Chakrabarti, who's from Jharkhand. And she's published a paper uh, which she calls, Is an Indian Ethics of Virtue Possible? She's a very young scholar. She's not even a PhD, I think. Uh, and she says that, uh, she concludes, we can conclude this discussion by saying that it is a unique feature of the Indian ethics of virtue that almost all virtues are conducive to spiritual development. And that's a good point. She's a young scholar. So she has done, and she quotes uh, Professor Parlinge, a modern introduction to Indian ethics and uh, books of this kind. So some work, I suppose, has already been done. Uh, and she quotes Professor S.K. Maitra, Maitra, The Ethics of the Hindu. That's the book and so forth. Anyhow, so some, I think some people have taken a stab at this. And then I found this other paper, I'm sure you know. It was by a professor in Idaho. Do you know him? Some of you may know him. Nicholas Gaia, Gear, Nicholas Gear. Dharma, Morality is Virtue Ethics. Professor Emeritus of Philosophy, Department of Philosophy, University of Idaho. Moscow, Idaho. I didn't know there was a Moscow in Bodega Growing, Idaho. But this came out in the book edited by Purushottam Dilimodaya. I have to email them. It turns out it was never published in that My goodness. It remains unpublished. So, so, so we could ask him for this. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it depends on him. I'll never interfere. The convener will be the editor. Uh, but, I mean, he, you see, he, he, from Gautama to Gandhi, he's trying to give you, I read this essay yesterday, so, from Gautama to Gandhi, he's trying to give you a survey of virtue ethics in India, with, of course, hop, step, and jump. The method is hop, step, and jump, because you have to leap over large uh, area. So, all of this comes to the end of the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, but I can't help... Uh, uh, mentioning one more thing. Let's go to the next slide. Here's the utter, it's called expand here, utter and absolute proof that virtue ethics has become very much a part of uh, Indian pursuits today. This is from a UPSC, what should I call them? Kunji. You know Kunji? Kunji kya hoti hai? Ki. Ki. You know Ki. Ki. It is a key, but it's a word for like you know bazaar notes. This is help book, kind of help book or uh, a crib or whatever you want to call it. Kya cheat sheet. Cheat sheet. Cheat sheet. Cheat sheet. So this is how to pass the IAS, the UPSC exam. <laughs> yeah. There's a question on virtue ethics. So <laughs> now, isse badhiya kya subhut ho sakta hai that Indians, whether they understand it properly or not. It's made it to the UPSC data. I thought you would be happy to know that. That uh, there is a, so somebody has given you, uh, so I, I got this yesterday, and the person's name, just the uparunga naam hai, because you know, I want to credit this person. His, his name, I think he calls himself Pacific. Let me see. So what happens is they put up these UPSC questions on the internet and people solve them so that others can cram based on these answers uh, you know how to answer this question so this question on vir virtue ethics had uh, you know several such possible answers you know and uh, yeah and this is by a person called pacify i don't know who pacify is they all work with pseudonyms but they help each other pass the Union Public Service Commission exam. And I thought, Kafi Honing, you know, it's been Hanab ki hai. You can see they've put in a lot of effort to help other people try to pass uh, the UPSC exam 
those who have opted for philosophy. So here's the paradox that for you to address, Dada, that on the one hand, nobody in India seems to have done much on virtue ethics, which was the premise with which we started, and it's needed to the UPSC cheat sheets. So with these remarks, thank you all very much. I do pardon my peccadilloes, if, uh, because I'm not, as I said, a trained philosopher. But I have the deepest respect <coughs> for philosophers. So I want to say one more special word of welcome because they help us think better and uh, uh, you know, they help us improve uh, you know, our commitment to knowledge. So thank you all. Welcome philosophers to this home of philosophy started by a philosopher. Thank you all. important um, areas. Um, uh, one thing I'd like to, uh, that came to my mind regarding what he said, in the Indian tradition, we have never bound ourselves within a geographical uh, boundary. Uh, when we talk about dharma, it is not regarding these people are Hindus or is dharma, is dharma. So virtue is needed not just for Hindus to be better Hindus, pass over to heaven, but this is needed for living or for any humankind of any, any, any denomination. Okay, and Tagore had uh, a, a made a very important remark he always did, is there are two expressions which don't uh, translate themselves from one language into the other, English or Bangla or Hindi or Sanskrit. One is dharma. There is no translation of dharma into English. I mean, dharma, not in the sense of religion, it's one of the meanings, but that's not the, the abiding meaning. And the other is politics, because we didn't have any politics. And also, as at age 17, he visited the uh, British Parliament, and he said, how childish these people are. He has written this. We should you know, highlight these things, think on this. You know. So uh, politics is a gift to us from British and see what myth it is doing to us. But might be that was well intended. They will die with our politics. Uh, another point, yes, uh, consequentialism, uh, deontology, virtue ethics, watertight compartmentalization. Uh, there is a book, uh, 2006, Conception of Virtue by Chong and Liu, two Chinese scholars, very, very well ed educated in virtue ethics. They write English very well. And there they say, yes, we had virtue ethics, but not as compartmentalized. So I would like to highlight this. Our virtue ethics, we did have virtue ethics. Certainly, mm -hmm. but we have to, you know, un unveil that, and uh, it was not compartmentalized as he touched upon the beginning. Uh, okay, so uh, namaskar to you all with the famous quote from Wittgenstein: "Language is the form of life." I I was a little apprehensive if I say namaskar, maybe I am offending some very generous Indians. Uh, oh, well, you are confining to the narrow culture of India or Hindu or something like that. I always, uh, already was uh, criticized for being a Hindu. Yeah, all right, uh, I am what I am. Uh, language is a form of life. I start my introductory notes with which 
the expensive form of life of my culture since ancient times. Kalidasa, the national poet of India, poet of India said, Asti Uttarasyam Dishi Nagadhirajo Himalaya. There is Devotatma Himalaya. She can hear. All right. So the Himalaya in the north, Devotatma, the spirit of the, of the Devas, that it crystallizes Himalaya crystallizes the spirit of the Devas. We are here at Shimla. As Shimla welcomes us with all her grace and beauty, the Himalaya, the king of the mountains, Nagadiraja, Devad, Devadatma, offers her. This conference should not have come into being but for the special interest. Yes, I mean it. Um, it's not repetition, it must. It's worth uh, repeating several times. A special interest Professor Makaran Paranjabi took in it when he chance to mention to him, as he said, the Parliament of World Religions, I brought to his notice that Michael Sloat, the famous virtue ethicist at the University of Miami, had been incorporating thoughts from the Chinese tradition in his creative work. While he, he indicates his lack of knowledge in the rich tradition of India. Well, this is our task, to bring that to light, what Billy Billy, Maria and I, I think they are not even trying. Yeah, they are getting books published. Makaranji instantaneously proposed that our hold as he said, which sloped as the keynote speaker. I have got in touch with almost all the participants personally and maintained continuous contact with them over the months on the internet and the phone. I'm thankful to them for having accepted my request. Well, all of them, I am amazed really they did and that materialized. The expression ethics has two senses. I was advised, uh, one of the great scholars, uh, to in, have some lokpas or retired judge, judges. The expression ethics has two senses. One relates to the codes of conduct. An ethics officer's task at an institution is to ensure that the prevailing code of conduct, codes of conduct are observed. That's ethics, one sense of ethics. In philosophy, ethics means discussion regarding the principles constituting justification for the ethical, ethical actions. We are going to deal primarily with philosophical ethics in our deliberations. Here, trying to find how ethical, uh, virtue ethics has, has had its place in the Indian continent, uh, subcontinent, since ancient times, unknown to, the, uh, to many of us. Not simply enumerating virtues is not. It doesn't amount to virtue ethics. You know, we must go to the philosophical root of virtue. Uh, Lisa, am I uh, off the mark? Am I uh, correct? Correct me. All right. Uh, uh, in his article in the Journal of Philosophy 2001, Amartya Sen threw the Bhagavad Gita out, considering it as high deontology, high ignorance, you know, residing in great scholars in one area, how that vitiates the atmosphere, I'm pain to say, as of the, of the worst kind, he said, hi, deontology. He didn't understand the bit of the Gita. He didn't care to. Without even going into the details of the ethical position to be found in the scripture, Jonathan Ganeri, in, in his 2006 article, A Cloak of Clever Words, De De Deconstruction of Deceit in the Mahabharata, published in, in the same volume, Conce Conceptions of Virtue, uh, does not lead us to a trace of virtue ethics in the epic. Purushottam Bilamoria in his writings has summarily written of, yes, summarily done, um, uh, blacky publication, the Bhagavad Gita without going deep into it. You know, I'm ready to say, you see, that the wrongs in the Gita, but that must be nicely philosophically placed. No, that has not been done to 
Time has come to see traces of some valuable elements of virtue ethics in the ancient literature in India. As the theme note says, the purpose of this conference is to uncover the virtue ethics to be found in the ancient literature of India. Not only enumeration of the virtues, but virtue ethics itself. The characteristic feature of the mainstream virtue ethics of modern times is its absolute dis dissociation from religion. This is due to the ways religious associ association unfolded in the history of the of the of the West. Here, that's a well, that's an accident of history. I'm not uh, defending religion, but that's the history that the. Um, uh, uh, anything spiritual has been uh, demolished from considerations of uh, any kind of you know, academic work. You know, at the, uh, at the, uh, there. Here we, are, we unfold the Indian virtue ethics without its association with religion. Hindu here does not mean Hindu religion. Uh, keeping the spiritual trust intact. Intact. Advaita Vedanta. Sankhya and yoga offer ways of pursuing spirituality outside of a religious form. And anybody can do it without being in it. In my presentation, I attempt to construct a model virtue ethical treatment of the area of ethics, namely of an area of ethics, environmental ethics, following the leads in the ancient Indian literature, taking my cues from the Gita. While attempts in the West have failed in the area, yeah, they have given up on, on virtue ethical treatment of environmental ethics. In the face of a venture of other, the um, uh, other way around, it is rather a cooperative venture between the East and the, and the West. When Barnard William, William gave us, so this, uh, we are doing a cooperative venture between the, we are not saying it is the Indian way. Yeah, it is the cooperative venture. Uh, when Bernard Williams, it is not only ask of many others have been responsible, gave us a call to go to the ancient times for leads in ethics today. He certainly didn't confine us to the ancient West. Now, I will read, uh, read out the, it's a shock, the resources of this is from Ethics and the Limits of Philosophy, his book. The resources of most moral philosophy are not adjusted to the modern world. I have tried to show this is partly because it is too much and too unknowingly caught up in it, unreflectively appealing to administrative ideas of rationality. Now, that is what Lokpal and the judges, they are doing. It is not a paradox that in these very new circumstances, very old philosophies may have more to offer than moderately new ones. So, this is a call, you know, people responded by going to Aristotle, but he didn't specify to Old West. So, I, uh, we have, ch have chosen to go to the Old West, Old East, old east yes. Um, uh, so, while I frame a theoretical frame for model of virtue ethics in the ancient spirit of the Hindu culture, keeping my Indian religion, including Hinduism, outside of my purview, I do include secular spirituality that harps on the concept of existential becoming, existential becoming, providing the grounding for the virtue ethics that works and the society is happy across the world with peace prevailing both as at the micro as well as the macro levels. So, so the, the, uh, the, once the theoretical foundation has been laid, Ananda Rup Chakravarti goes to its application to the corporate world of today in the West as well as in India, for reasons of uh, sustainability. Being located in the corporate sector in the West, West he speaks from personal experience as he sees from, as he sees from the uh, management angle 
the relevance of the application of virtue ethics today in the workplace, not only for better work culture, but for deeper reasons as well. So Indian virtue ethics uh, is uh, very much of a light for him. Ajay Maharaj leads us to the Vedantic virtue ethics. Ajay Maharaj, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, well, uh, I'm an old man, and uh, these small prints. Mm. That the, to the Vedantic virtue ethics, that Swami Vivekananda envision for, the, uh, for application today without adhering to geographical boundaries. He didn't speak about India only. Uh, shunning parochial religious association while embracing secular spirituality all the way. Ajay Jaisava leads us back to the ancient times of the yoga philosophy in his search for formulation of virtue ethics in the ancient Indian style appropriate for application today. Am I right? Rupa Vandavatha makes a scholarly, she always does, scholarly presentation in her portrayal with recourse to the ancient virtue ethics in India. Uh, we start our Friday session with Balbir Sihabji, the great scholar, portraying the economic thoughts in Arthashastra, accommodated in the background of their application in the vir virtue ethics frame of reference for the administration, uh, administrator. This presentation is followed by Sanjay Mukherjee, on Rajeshi model of administration. Well, it is not the same as the philosopher king concept. It goes beyond, I guess we get the uh, idea from him, that fits into the ancient Indian model of administration in the virtue ethical perspective relevant for today. Thoughts of two other great thinkers in modern India, world figures in their own rights, who had virtue ethical underpinning in their distinctively outstanding ways will find expression in the presentation of Indrani Sanya uh, and also uh, Shepali uh, Maitra. While depicting the virtue ethics uh, present in the Vedantic tradition in India since ancient times in the backdrop of secular spirituality, we Kumar, uh, Kumar Murthy, well, he is really an, uh, an exciting personality. She is the, he is, mm, he, mm, a, a, is a, a outstanding figure in modern the mathematics, uh, a world figure. She is the compatibility of secular spirituality with science to the mutual benefit of both areas. In her pres presentation, Lisa, Lisa Wadison connect strains of Indian virtue ethics to the train of thoughts in the academic study of virtue ethics today. This is what we need to do. We will not only say, simply say, it is virtue ethics. Michael Sloat has taken an immense, in, immense interest in the symposium all the way since the idea of the symposium was floated about a year ago. It is unfortunate that he cannot physically be present with us today due to health conditions that stand in the way of the long trip he needs to make to uh, attain this important. <laughs> it is so kind of him to have volunteered to make the presentation on Skype in order to minimize the loss to the conference with his absence. Credit certainly goes to the IAS for having made the adjustment in timing, which is uh, quite uh, a big challenge for them, <laughs> a difficult task indeed in order to accommodate the, the time difference between Miami and India. Dennis Whitmer is making a Skype presentation Saturday morning, sharing with us his long experience in teaching business administration students at the University of Denver with the help of concepts from Aristotle, as Aristotelian virtue, virtue ethics while showing the relevance of these concepts to business transaction. Nirmalu Narayan Chakravarti defends the occurrences of often cited instances from the Mahabharata against the charge of 
flouting the accepted moral, moral codes. This is, when they say, this is what Mahabharata is, mm, cheating and all that. He shows them as morally sound as well. Oh, after all, here in this symposium, we are engaging in, engaged in doing world philosophy. This is the Michael uh, Sloat uses this expression. This is not philosophizing, saying, yeah, this is the real philosophy, and Scove and all that, and oh, there is Indian philosophy. Yeah. Also mentioned, <coughs> no, 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 doing them together. <laughs> World philosophy, a practice Sloat attempts to popularize. As we philosophize here, combining both the standard <coughs> Anglo-Saxon analytical kind and the traditional Indian kinds. We are, I was introduced myself to this kind of philosophizing as a student by, student by my philosophy teacher, outstanding philosopher, uh, philosophy teacher. I didn't find a parallel <coughs> in the West. I, uh, I did my PhD in the West. Uh, Gopinath Bhattacharya at Presidency College, Calcutta, and Jadapur University, Calcutta. He formulated a syllabus, syllabus which does equal justice to Indian philosophy and as well as Western philosophy. Uh, I'm thankful to New College, University of Toronto, for allowing me to carry in, carrying on my work on Tagore and virtue ethics severally and together, a support that has resulted into the paper I present today. I mean, this is a really outstanding support. I uh, thank you should say, no, no, I, I lacked in any support uh, from India. I couldn't, except, except for this one. Yes. I mean, this is a big one. I especially thank Bonnie Mackel Hine, principal, New <coughs> College, June Larkin, oh, she is fabulous, June Larkin, vice principal, New College, and Eve Roberts, ex-principal, New College, who wants to sanction me a travel grant for the college, from the college, toward attending an international seminar on Tagore and, 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 and Einstein at IIS Shimla. My special thanks goes to Makaran Paranjali, to have allowed me to arrange deliberations on Indian virtue ethics in India. Uh, this, is, this sounds paradoxical. You know, it is, it is kind of impossible to do it in India at an international stage. Uh, um, uh, to uh, go to the Indian tradition, pariprasnena sevaya, that's what Sri Krishna says, pariprasnena, uh, questions from all directions are welcome. I mean, this is not just this seminar, but this has been uh, Amartya Sen speaks, uh, has started his book, uh, The Argumentative. He has not uh, seen any of these real, the real pieces. Uh, but, but, Sevaya with Shraddha, the questions must be not as slogan raising, but with, uh, you know, with Shraddha. Mm. Uh, uh, we are missing Amita here, Amita, she is one of the outstanding, real good philo uh, living philosophers, Indian philosophers today. Mm. And Rosalind Hustles, I first approached her, but unfortunately she is not keeping well, she cannot move. But she has been very much, a, not only an inspiration, I have had long co correspondence with her uh, on my thoughts, and she has Specifically, over the years, over 10 years, she has encouraged me to do this kind of, carry on this kind of thinking. And she has said, she has agreed to me that what I have said, that samatva is the virtue, not only for virtue ethics, but for all kinds of ethics, from virtue ethical perspective. And as I have mentioned in the team note, uh, she has written to me uh, that this has the, this virtue has the, this is the base virtue, has the added ad advantage that it shows the unity of the virtues that Aristotle was after, but which uh, the an endeavor that always eluded him. I mean, unity of virtue, because these are all disparate. You do this, do this. It's not a list, 
but they are, it is they are the base, you know, the base virtue, the samatha, and that comes from the second chapter of the Gita. So at least, uh, I mean, Mukherjee has at least this purpose, and I can speak. Not just I, I, I. But we can. <laughs> we can. Thank you so much, Siddhanshada, and thank you for putting it up, up front and out there that we are not interested to do some narrow kind of revivalistic or fanaticization of or fossilization or revanchist some kind of stuff with uh, ancient Indian thought, not at all. We want to do world philosophy. Yes. And we want to do world philosophy in a different way, not from a certain kind of anxiety, or from a sense of inferiority, or trying to play catch up, but actually in an integrative, comprehensive, inviting manner. Thank you very much for saying that, because I must tell you a little anecdote that, you know, some years ago I ran a journal called Evam, a forum on Indian thought, and uh, in those days, bumped into Sitan Shuddha and he said, you know, Makran, the great Amartya Sen has written on the Bhagavad Gita without understanding the text. This is how he talks. And, uh, and he says, but nobody has the courage to stand up and uh, write a refutation. And I said, why don't you do it? I said, he said, I've tried, but nobody will publish it. No Western journal will publish it. He told me, he, he sent it to a few journals. So I said, okay, Dada, we'll publish it. And uh, so he gave us the paper. It's an excellent paper. It's still available. Uh, and uh, he wanted to start a debate. So first of all, we had a blind clear into the system. So I sent it out. And some major philosophers in India, and uh, I did send it to Professor Sharad Deshpande. I should have. But they also said, we can't touch it. We can't... Uh, publish anything which, which criticizes Amartya Sen. And uh, then uh, I said, okay, we'll publish it. So I read the whole thing myself. I read his paper. I read uh, Dada's paper. And it was a very, I would say, very civilized debate that was going on. But such was the, uh, you might say, the miasma of political correctness that had engulfed us in those days that nobody have the courage. The story doesn't end. I mean, I read uh, Amartya Sen's article, and he, and he also, not only does he dismiss the Gita for, uh, you know, as, you, as you said, high de deontology, but also for non-consequentialism of the worst sort, because you can kill people and you can get away with it, because uh, Krishna says they're already dead. You know, the people who I'm asking you to kill are already dead. So he says this is the worst kind of virtue text. Anyhow, so then we decided to publish it, and somehow the word went around. And then I started getting uh, certain kinds of feelers from people, saying that you know, Makran, you don't pu you don't publish this. I said why? They said no, it, it's going to affect your career. There's a mafia that controls Indian academics. And uh, I mean, I won't go into the detail, but I can tell you I was blacklisted from several journals which had nothing to do with philosophy. You know, but the, the, the network is so strong, I tell you. And I think I'm glad there are cracks that are beginning now to appear. Anyhow, so that was one, one story I wanted to tell. And uh, I think that uh, uh, Dr. Sutanshu Chakrabarti has, has published with uh, you know, yeah, very well, fine I'm publishers, ideological publishers, uh, Munshira, Manohara, you know, books of his have come out on Mahabharata and so forth. But, you know, as he said, he has no support in India. Nobody calls him. <coughs> Let's not get into it. We, have, we want to be on a positive note. <coughs> I want to say that this argument that Mahabharata endorses violence and uh, that the Indian tradition <coughs> is split into two, that the Hindu tradition is violent, 
Buddhist and Zen tradition is born by pitting them against each other. This has been a standard practice for a long time. And even Rajmohan Gandhi has written in this fashion. Mahatma Gandhi's grandson, where he sees uh, the Mahabharata, the text that endorses violence. And you know, I, had, I must share with you, see, people from literature can also be very creative. So I had a wonderful argument. I mean, one of the best arguments that the Gita uh, does not promote violence, though it seems to promote violence, comes from a friend of mine, Srinivas Aravamudan, who teaches at Duke. And he makes a very disingenuous argument. He says, don't go by what Krishna is telling Arjuna. But go by the fact that in the middle of the war, there are two armies and then there's a dialogue going on. So basically he's saying, the Gita is trying to tell you that in order to prevent fighting or delay fighting, you've got to talk. <laughs> so it's a very interesting argument, which, which is not a philosophical argument. I'm just saying. So I think this is what uh, world philosophy in many ways is about. And while we were talking, Sharad Bhavas quickly sent me a mail, so I must read it out. I think these are the joys of being at IIAS, surrounded by fertile minds. And he said, Bakran, please refer to Dipankar Chatterjee's excellent article titled Towards a Better Understanding of Indian Ethics in an anthology titled Indian Philosophy Past and Present, edited by S.S. Ramarao Papu and R. I mean, we know Ramaro Papuji and started waves and, and so on. So this is perhaps the best article in Indian virtue ethics. Thank you, Sharadra. You'll have your turn. You don't have to send, send me notes. Since you mentioned this, the, the list of articles, I thought I should bring it to your notes. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I, I want to bring one more text to our notice, which I think is a wonderful text, which people in India haven't really noticed. And uh, it's, it's a book, uh, I don't know how many people have uh, heard of this book. It's, uh, it was published, uh, you know, like many other wonderful books pertaining to India by George Eastman at the SUNY Press, you know, State University of New York Press. Uh, uh, and uh, it's called The Comparative History of World Philosophy, from the Upanishads to Kant. And it's by Ben Ami Sharstein. And have you seen this book? It's really a wonderful <coughs> book because, you know, it's a way to do world philosophy. And, you know, we, we are trying to do world philosophy. We're not saying Western philosophy, Eastern philosophy, how can we add on to Western philosophy, which is the only real philosophy, etc. We are always trapped in this, even in Indian philosophy departments. But there's a way to pedagogically as well as theoretically reconstruct the field. And I think he does it. And he starts with some very bold statements. And I just wanted to read one. He says, what in this history is considered to be philosophical? He starts with this question. We have time, so that's why we can do this. Aram you know, There are three great philosophical traditions, he says. Indian, the Chinese, and the European. Before I describe them, I want to ask. In other words, the Chinese component is still lacking in our deliberation, but hopefully we'll be able to add it. You mentioned that, but before I describe it, I want to ask and answer very briefly what a philosophical tradition is. Why I say there are only three such traditions, and why it is best to study them together as they are studied here, rather than separately or successively. What is a philosophical tradition? He says, a chain of persons who relate their thoughts to that of their predecessors, and in this way, form a continuous transmission from one generation to the next, from teacher to disciple to disciple's disciple. That, he thinks, is a philosophical tradition. Or rather, because the whole tradition is made up of many sub-traditions, it is one and the same tradition all of these sub-traditions share common sources and modes of thought and develop a reaction to one another. So I think this is a good working definition. And though Shastan is Jewish, he does not include the Hebrews among the ancient philosophers of the world. And when he goes to European philosophy, he starts with the Greeks. So this is a book worth looking at. Uh, I think. Uh, 
systematic inquiry into uh, you know, speculative matters is, is, is really uh, in, a, in a chain of transmission, is a, is a way to understand philosophical inquiry. And his first chapter begins with, uh, I want to go to that for just a moment, begins with Indian philosophy. And he starts with Indian philosophy because he thinks, he claims that this is the oldest philosophical tradition. And uh, when he explores Indian philosophy, again he doesn't do it like uh, Amartya Sen does in argumentative Indian as a clash between, a dialectical clash between two traditions. But he, he takes it in a completely different, integrated manner. And uh, I also want to bring to our notice of this table one more little thing. You started with Wittgenstein. I think that was an auspicious beginning for us because uh, Anscombe was a student of Wittgenstein. And she started studying philosophy because of Wittgenstein. She was so taken by his work. And even when she went to Somerville College, Oxford, she went she would go to Cambridge every week to visit yeah. to Wittgenstein. And when Wittgenstein was dying, he made her one of his three executors. So she translated his work after he died. I bring this connection because somehow Wittgenstein seems to be a great bridge for us in India, for those of us who want to do world philosophy. Uh, Professor Sarat Deshpande has also done some wonderful work on Wittgenstein. In fact, he's done a book which we hope to publish as soon as he gives it to us, which is, uh, you know, you can speak a little bit about it when you're chairing the session, but it's a wonderful dialogue, you know. And, uh, you know, it's like these balls that Wittgenstein is playing with, and so many interlocutors come into that dialogue of world philosophy. And so many of Wittgenstein's disciples came to India and set up philosophy departments. One is Professor K.J. Shah, Another one is, is uh, Professor Ramchandra Gandhi, who started with Strawson as a philosopher of language and analytical philosopher, and then moved towards Advaita. In his wonderful book, I Am Thou, you know, it's such a great book of, of philosophy. And there are many such, I would say, disciples of Wittgenstein in India, in Jadapur, in Hyderabad, in Delhi. Uh, and so I think this is wonderful bridge and perhaps somebody here can do a conference, can propose a conference on, on how to do world philosophy via Wittgenstein and bring in all these Indians and Western disciples of Wittgenstein and those who departed from him, uh, you know, to Shimla. So wonderful ideas are coming up. I just want to end with one story about Ansko uh, that she says in her biography somewhere that she used to spend hours, you know, in cafes in Cambridge and elsewhere, London, staring at objects and asking, what is this that I look at? What is that package that I'm looking at? And, you know, following Russell and so forth, that is it real? What is it? What is the nature of objects? And she says that if Wittgenstein's theory of language and science that liberated her, from this chakra view into which she was trapped and she didn't know how to get out of it. That she understood the difference between objects and signs and so forth. So I think that, I think this is a, a good bridge. I'm glad you brought in Wittgenstein. It resonates with a lot of people here. And I think that's it. We'll have tea, we'll have a picture and tea and then the conference begins. Thank you all very much. Thank you.